I see you. Linda Daniels, excellent. Mabel Royster, Joe Garcia, Munaweki, Ginger Knott, come on. Charlene Garrison, blessings. Oh my goodness, God is doing great things in a marvelous way. Connie Lockett, I see you up there. God is doing a marvelous thing. Oh, God is good. Okay, I hope you're ready. We're gonna jump into the word tonight. Ready, ready, ready. Yes. So I want you to think about something. We're talking about these kingdom principles. And as we talk about kingdom principles, the parables of Jesus, he is revealing to us his language, his mindset. So I want to touch on that just a little bit. How until you let God change your thinking, your world cannot change. Until you let God change your thinking, your world cannot change. Oh, we're diving right in. Because there's so much, as, as I've been reading and studying, this is why I love y'all and I love the class. The more I read, the more I'm learning. Michael Reeves, my brother, my friend, we greet you, sir. Come on in. The more I'm learning, the more in love with the word I'm falling all over again. And I'm discovering in this hour that the word of God is the systematic way to change our mind. Yes. So if we do not get into the word in a systematic, what do I mean by systematic? You have to have a organized, thorough process of reading, deciphering, and then manifesting scripture. An organized way of reading, processing, and manifesting scripture. If you do not have an organized way, that means that your approach to God will always be hit or miss, up and down. It'll always be based on your time and your emotions. If you do not understand that you have to approach God with a clear way to study God, Laura Shula, I see you here. Come on. If you don't understand that you must have an organized way to approach God. Now, organized doesn't mean legalistic. Many times in the world we live in now and in the uh, Gifty Edwards, I see you, my friend. Many times in the world we live in now. Oh, I love y'all. Y'all are y'all are popping notes tonight. Come on. Many in many of the circles in which the Bible is taught, in many of the conferences in which we attend, the word of God is almost a secondary thought. Uh, we gather for the show. We often gather for the performance. We gather for the fanfare. But we forget that the kingdom of God is built on the word of God. So because God is a, this is where we're going to get into the depth of understanding this. Because God is a God of covenant. God builds on his word. Now, God is all powerful. God is all knowing. God is everywhere all at the same time. God is the one who made the rules, thereby no one can control him. God created wisdom so no one can outthink him. And God created language. So no one can trick him with the way they mix words together. So God, who is the creator of language, God, the origin of thought, God, the builder of covenant, God now, who is the first to create covenant, the first to create language, and the first to think a thought in the middle of nothing until something came out of his thoughts. So you must understand in the process of the kingdom, yes. I like that. Don't play semantics with the language creator. You'll never be able to trick God with a turn of a phrase. You'll never be able to manipulate God because the power of manipulation requires that the person whom you're manipulating is less than the intelligence of the one or able to be controlled or maneuvered by the one who has power to move them. So whether you're moving someone by your emotions, you're moving them by 
blackmail, you're moving them by a deal, you're moving them by desire, you're moving them by sin, or you're moving them by praise. Every form of manipulation requires that someone sees what you're giving them as worthy of them yielding to you. There is nothing in creation that God sees as valuable enough that he would throw away, get rid of, or lessen his integrity. That's why the first thing about God we see in the language of angels is holy, holy, holy. The weight of God's integrity is found in the very idea of holiness. So if you are in the kingdom of God and you're going to approach God, to know his language gives you access to covenant. To know his nature gives you access to power. Mm. But to know his heart gives you access to glory. So you must understand, when we come to God, the kingdom rests on you knowing who God is, you knowing who God is in you, and you knowing who you are in God. Those three things are irrefutable. I'm going to say them again. The weight of the kingdom, the knowledge of the kingdom, the power of the kingdom rest in this. You must know who God is. You must know who God is. You must know what he loves, what he likes, what he desires. So I'm going to ask you a simple question as we continue to dig into this. Can you give me, and some of you who are keeping up, can you right now on the screen, here's where we're talking, who God is, okay? Can you tell me three words, or let's break it down. Give me two words to describe who God is. On your screen right now, let those fingers go to work. Give me two words to describe who God is. Two words, come on, yes. Two words to describe who God is. Camille Sinclair, yes. Ah, Nastasia, I am, that's good. Camille, creator, eternal, I love it. Connie Lockett, holy, righteous, excellent. Omar Miranda, father, creator. Oh, y'all are working good tonight. Beatrice Manu, faithful, judge, good. Danny Shepherd, holy, merciful, I like it. Linda Daniels, King and Lord. Oh, I got Bible students tonight. Mabel Royster, love and faithful. Excellent. Latif Winston, I am. Excellent. Gifty Edwards, love, word, I am. Good. Angela Rogers, just and holy. Wendy Mark, love and kindness. This is good. Charlene Garrison, Elohim and peace. Oh, woo, we in the word tonight. DJ, love and judge. Rachel Newman, Alpha and Omega. Oh, now you done walked up in Revelation. Come on here. Laura Shula, honorable and worthy. <laughs> Nastasha, oh, he's the yes and the amen. M Munu, oh, Muna, holy, love, excellent, excellent. Becky, creator of everything living, good. Lord of hosts. Now, see, this is good. I love this. When you can understand Angela Rogers, omnipotent creator, redeemer of mankind. Come on, y'all are working. Danny Shep, oh, he's El Aroi, the God who sees me. Gifty Edwards, he's Jaira, hey, the God who supplies. Righteous and just, oh, come on now. He is righteous and he is just, oh, come on. Jehovah Jaira, Rachel Newman. Jehovah, he's Sid Canu. El Shaddai. Now, see, I love this. This is Bible class. This is a group of people who know that word. Now, think about this, okay? Jehovah Nisi, come on. Okay, now, stop, stop, because we're going to go to the next one. Immutable one. Y'all about to make me run now. Now, all of these El Shaddai, Jehovah Nisi, immutable one, the one who is and is to come. Now, think about this. The first statement was, can you tell me who God is? Okay. Now the next question. Give me two things God loves. Right now on your screen, two things he loves. Two things the Bible says he loves. 
truth and faith. Yes. Give me two things God loves. Not that you hope he loves, not you think he loves, and don't put on the screen me. We're not going there. Give me two things God loves. Yes, he loves faith. Excellent. Yes, he loves faith. What else does God love? What does the word talk about? Ah, faith and obedience. Yes, Becky. A cheerful giver. You're in the word, Angela Rogers. Sincerity. Yes. He loves a sincere heart. Come on, Mabel Royster. Worship. Yes. Beatrice, you got it. DJ, cheer. forget. Oh, forgiveness. You better work the word, DJ. A cheerful giver. True worship, Camille Sinclair. He's still looking for true worshipers. Jan Danny Shepard. Justice and mercy. You better talk. Gift of obedience. He loves obedience more than sacrifice. A righteous man. Excellent, Rachel. Linda Daniels, praise and obedience. Yes, ma'am. Rachel Newman, humility. Oh, oh, you're talking good. Connie Lockett, mercy and grace. Absolutely. Justice. The Bible says the Lord loves justice. He hates an unjust balance. Latif Winston, a broken and a... Latif, I'm about to wave the handkerchief at you. That's right. Those who love him with all their heart. Yes. Willingness and obedience, Charlene Garrison. Yes, ma'am. The word, Latif, now you're in the word with me. I was waiting to see if any of you named the world. Latif and Nastasia, y'all are there. Angela Rogers, work the word. For God so loved the world. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, think about this. So take the two things that you know about God. And he loves those that love him. Oh, yes, he does. So two things you know about God. You know who he is, okay? Now, you know what he loves. Now, let me ask you the question. Who can remember what the third thing I asked you? Colette Weston, you're right on. He loves us and Jesus. For God so loved his own son. He loved the world and he gave his son. So now the question is, who remembers what the third thing I asked you? I said, you have to know what God loves. You have to know who God is. What was the third thing you had to know? Ah, Danny Shepherd, come on here. What does he desire? So what does God desire? Yes. Oh, Gifty Edwards, you're already walking it out. Come on. There's a few other things the Bible says he desires. He desires that everyone would come to know him. That's right. Wendy Mark. He desires that none should perish. It is not his will that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. He desires that we would all have relationship with him. Yes, Angela Rogers. Connie Lockett, that none should perish. Camille Sinclair, none should perish. He desires obedience and trust. Yes. Ginger not. He desires our repentance from a whole heart. Mm. See, this is where now he desires that we would yield to him. You're spot on. He desires that we would love him first. Yes, Gifty Edwards. Now, I want y'all to just take a moment. Angela Rogers, you jumped there before I could get there. This is good. Partnership. That all should have everlasting life. So now, okay, you mighty Bible class, you thinkers of the word, he desires that. DJ, you got there before I could get that scripture out. His desire that all should perish. I mean, excuse me, that all should prosper, not perish. My desire is that all of you would prosper as your soul would prosper. So God's desire is that you would prosper. And in your prosperity, you would bring people to know him. And in that relationship of bringing people to him and bringing the kingdom through you, you would remain in good health all the days of your life. Now, let's tie these three things together. The knowledge of the kingdom. So first, I want y'all to think about everything you said that you know about God. Now, if each one of you would go through your life, and make a list and keep it on your refrigerator. 
of what you know to be true about God, especially as you've studied the kingdom and the New Testament. I want you now, every time some negative inference comes to your mind about who you were taught God was, you need to take that and physically say, I don't receive that. Make a list of what you know to be true. I know God is good. He is merciful. He is kind. He is loving. He's a healer. He's marvelous. He's wonderful. He's the lover of my soul. So you go through all those names you know about God. And there are, there are, there are posters that have all the names of God. I keep the names of God in a book. I keep them in my phone and I keep them in a notepad because on the days when the devil says, you know, when you got mad on the freeway, when somebody cut you off or when you were in the store and they were rude to you or when you were sick and didn't get healed quickly, you know, that's because the Lord is trying to teach you a lesson. He's upset with you. Those thoughts still try to come back to me. So you've got to understand all of us are walking in the beauty of revelation. I don't struggle with those thoughts, but they come to visit. As long as you walk with God in this kingdom, the earth is full of bad thinking. Bad thinking is looking for a place to rest. Like a bird without a nest, it's trying to find a landing place. Now, you must choose what you let live in your mind. So when stuff comes to visit me, I've got the names of God around. So when rejection comes and says, mm, you know, you messed up. The Lord ain't for you right now. He's trying to teach you something. I flip to that place where it says he's my redeemer. He's the everlasting God. He is a good father. He is my blesser. I go back to that and I say out loud, devil, you're a liar. You are trying to tell me something about God that the word says ain't true. So I rebuke you right now. You can't sit here. You can't rest here. I refuse your lie. Come on, Danny Shepherd. no vacancy sign. You might find some house on this street, but you can't stop here. Keep on walking, devil. You've got to understand that there is no space in your place for him to dwell. So you have to have the knowledge of God first so that no one can convince you to doubt the character of God. The kingdom works for those who are convinced of God's character. The kingdom works for those convinced of God's character. So you first must be convinced of his character. Do you believe he is a good God? Do you believe he is a healing God? Do you believe he is kind all the time? Do you believe that he wants the best for you? If you're not convinced of the character of God, then when hard days come, the moment you question his character, you doubt his plan for you. When you doubt his plan for you, you'll question his provision in your life. When you question his provision in your life, you open the door for the devil's accusation. When you let the devil's accusation come in, you then say, whatever the devil wants to send me, I agree with because I don't believe that my life is devil proof. I didn't say the devil can't hit you, but devil proof means he can't stay. So you've got to understand, when I say devil proof, I mean devil proof. I don't mean trial proof. I don't mean trouble proof. Trouble will come. Trials will come. Heartaches will come. That's life. Every human on the planet will have those things. But the devil having the right to sit in my mind, my mind is devil proof. You might stand outside the window, but you ain't coming up in this house. You might yell outside the yard, but you're not coming through the front door. You might accuse me, but you ain't going to use me. So you've got to understand, you've got to build a devil-proof mind. Come on now, Connie Lockett, yeah, devil-proof. Danny Shepherd, the devil is a punk, and his mama ain't got no teeth. So you got to recognize, you've got to build a wall around your mind. The first wall of protection in the kingdom 
is I know who God is. I know who God is. Come on. Yes, Linda Daniels, woman of God. You've got to keep your distance. You've got to build space between you and the thoughts of the world. You've got to build space between fear and unbelief. So fear may come, but it cannot cross the bloodline because I put the watchdog of the word in my yard. So when the enemy tries to get in with a foul thought, the watchdog of the word begins to bark and say, no, not here. No, not here. So when fear comes and says, God ain't going to take care of you, up out of my belly, I hear, no, not here. For the Lord shall be with you until the end of the age, even to the end of time. So when Depression tries to come. I hear the watchdog of the word saying, nope, not here. For I have peace that passes all understanding. When the enemy tries to come in like a tower against me, there is a flood that raises up in front of me. You've got to understand that scripture when it says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Now, I love that scripture. But you've got to understand the commas in that scripture were placed in hundreds of years after that scripture were written. There were no commas. So the right phrasing of the scripture is when the enemy comes in, comma, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall rise and put a standard against him. So the devil ain't coming like a flood. The Holy Ghost responds like a flood. You've got to have the right phrasing. That's why you've got to look at some of the original text. So when the enemy comes in, comma. When the devil comes in, comma. Yes, there were no com there's no commas in Hebrew. Commas were invented by English when we began to write books or by greater society later on, different societies later on, because in the Hebrew culture, they didn't need the commas because the word gave the tense, future tense, past tense, plural tense, female or male. So you knew by the words where it was phrasing. The word told you which direction it was pointing in. So when you look at how it's broken down, it says when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the spirit of God shall rise and lift up a standard. So God is declaring, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on now. So now let's look at it. This is how the King James puts it out. Thank you, Aida. Now in the King James, in the English language, the commas and semicolons were put in by English writers. But these commas and semicolons did not exist. Why? Because the Bible was not written in English. It was written in Hebrew, some Greek, and in a lot of places, Aramaic. So all of these nuances, when people are teaching in English and they go, you need to look at that and understand the comma is telling you, what, no commas? So make sure you study some of the original text and the original commentators to get a better understanding because you're teaching from an English perspective, from a Western perspective. But the Bible wasn't written by Westerners. It was written by Middle Easterners. So if you don't understand a Middle Eastern mindset and the phraseology in the language, you will misunderstand victory. So for hundreds of years, we've been walking around saying when the enemy comes in like a flood, Oh, I've had days when the devil was like a flood. And that's not what it's saying. So let's look at it. We're going to hit this thing again. Yes. When the enemy comes in, I'm loving this. Now I got to go back to it. Okay. Wait, let me open it right here. Oh, I'm loving this tonight. Oh, we're digging in. All right. Isaiah 59. The Holy Spirit has been telling me all day, trust me, this is part of understanding the parables, but we need to be here tonight because language, understanding, the mind of God, this transforms everything. All right, Isaiah 59. 
Now, look at this and jump into this. Look at verse 19. No, no, no. Let's go back to 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. So what is this verse referring to? This verse is actually referring to Jesus who would become the intercessor. He saw that there was no man when no man could redeem Israel. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. No priest could pray the nation through. Therefore, his arm brought salvation. Who is the arm of God? Jesus. He is the branch. He is the offshoot. He is the arm. The body was the father. The arm is Jesus and the hand is the Holy Ghost. So in the Old Testament, when it says that the, the Lord God sat, it's speaking of the father. When it says that the arm of the Lord was revealed, this is Jesus. From the body through time. That's Jesus. But when it says and the hand of God was upon them, that's the Holy Ghost, the touch of heaven. So the body is the father. Isaiah 59, verse 16. We're starting at verse 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Yes, thank you. So sitting when it talks about the body, when it talks about the throne, that's always talking about the father. When they said they saw God on the throne, that's always the father. When the body of God is revealed in the Old Testament, it is the father. Whenever you see a scripture that says, and the arm of the Lord was revealed, that's talking about Jesus. The arm of the Lord shall be revealed. The arm of God was seen in the camp. The arm of the Lord brought you victory. That's Jesus, that's the victory of Christ. That is the son of God. He is the arm of God. He is the extension of the father through time to man. The hand of God, whenever it's mentioned in the old covenant, is talking about the Holy Ghost, the power of God resting. So he laid his hand on them. It's not eternal. It was for purpose. Whenever the priest put their hand on someone, it was to release power. Whenever the prophet laid their hand on someone, it released position. So the hand speaks of the impartation. The body is the father. The arm is Jesus. The hand is the Holy Ghost. Let's go on. Verse 16. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. We know this was referring to the priesthood could not pray and they could not operate holy enough to lift sin off the nation. So God is wondering, is there no one who can carry their sin? But how is that prayer answered? The Bible says we know that Jesus is the high priest. So when we could not find an intercessor, we know that Jesus ever lives. He prays for us. He's making intercession for us. So he is the intercessor. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, what a marvelous God. Therefore, when he could find no one who could pray, when he could find no one who could stand, therefore, his arm brought salvation. To who? To him. So his arm, Jesus, extended from heaven, extended through humanity, his arm reached from glory into time. His arm reached from nothing into tangibility. And his arm brought him salvation. So Jesus reached out from the Father and brought the Father back, sons and daughters. And his righteousness sustained him. What does that mean? So his arm brought salvation saved us from our sins and his righteousness, it sustained him. So the righteousness of God, because there was no sin in him, it sustained him. Death could not hold him. Fear could not control him. So he got up from the grave. His righteousness took him through hell, back out of the cave, back out of the grave. And his righteousness sustained him, carried him, 
kept him, his own righteousness. Jesus was so powerful in his righteousness, in his holiness, in his glory, that nobody raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible says he raised himself. His righteousness was so powerful that in the grave, that's why the Bible says the grave felt pregnant. Woo! His righteousness was so glorious that when he went into the grave, the earth began to feel redemption. The earth began to boil with re revolution. The earth began to feel revival. The earth began to feel resurrection. And the earth said, we can't hold him. If he stays down here too long, he'll split the world in two. We can't hold him. If he stays down here too long, every volcano will explode. We can't hold him. If he stays down here too long, every tree will bear fruit. Every river will become an ocean. Every ocean will rise up and prophesy. We can't hold him. Winds will begin to dance and birds will begin to speak in tongues and the oxen will begin to dance. Why? Because the very earth is releasing revival. So the grave, that's why the, the Bible says he is the first begotten of the dead. He's the firstborn. Death gave birth and said, you got to get out of here. We can't hold you. Too much power. Hey, 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 hey. Woo. So the Bible says his righteousness sustained him. Woo. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose the winner of the dark domain. He arose, he arose, he arose. Hey, death couldn't hold him. Hell didn't understand him. Demons ran from him. The world said, I feel like I'm in labor. What is this that has entered into the earth? What is this that his power is so glorious? The Bible says when he died, 500 began to get up. Do you understand that the Bible says 500 dead men got up and walked in Jerusalem? Yay! That's how powerful Jesus is. That's how powerful his kingdom is. That's how the Bible says the dead that had died before Jesus died, everybody that had been buried in Jerusalem in the last few weeks, when Jesus went into the grave, the dead sat up and said, who just came here? Who is that? I, I, I got to, do you understand? See, we talk about Jesus rising from the dead, but nobody preaches on that. The Bible says, and the dead got up. After Jesus went into the grave, it says, and the dead who had died got up. Oh, you better hear me. He had so much power. Hey, Shopaya, come on now. So it says 500 saw his power. Hey, but the Bible says, yes. So that's those that were witness to his glory. But if you go back and look, there's a verse that says, and when he died, some that had died before him arose. So when Jesus died, his resurrection power was so great in his body that those that had died the day before he died sat up. Can you imagine you just buried grandma? And grandma died yesterday, as the old folks say, yes, did he? Grandma died the day before. And now, all of a sudden, everybody's weeping because Jesus died. Mm. And while they're weeping about Jesus dying, you're walking back home and you go past the graveyard. And you see a woman that looks like your grandma. And she says, Hey, baby. Grandma, we buried you. Uh, like Shanae said, Big Mama, what you doing getting up? We wrapped you up yesterday. She said, I, I know I was dead because I was in Abraham's bosom. But I heard the voice of one that sounded like thunder. I heard the voice of one 
who move like lightning. I heard the voice of one with glory on his tongue and power in his hands. I had heard that he was coming. I was talking to Abraham and singing with David. I was asking Isaiah and Ezekiel. I was talking to Elijah and Elisha. But all of a sudden, everybody in heaven stopped talking and we looked and we heard the angels say, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, he is dead. And when his blood hit the ground, heaven went silent. When his blood hit the ground, devils began to scatter. When his blood hit the ground, dead men got up. When his blood hit the ground, hell began to weep. Do you understand the power of the kingdom you are in? You are in a kingdom that cannot be conquered. You are in a kingdom that cannot fail. You are in a kingdom that God has called you to be in. You've got more power inside of you than you understand. Wendy Mark, I, I don't know. It doesn't say they died after. It just says they came back to life. I don't believe they went right back and died. I believe they stayed awake. And I believe they were part of those who became witnesses in the upper room. I believe some of the ones that woke up, they kept asking people, what does this mean? And then they were part of the glory. Oh, I surely do. I surely do. The Bible says over 500 were witnesses to his resurrection. Some who were dead, came back. What power is this, Christ? What kind of glory does it carry? Now, let's go back. I think it was Camille who asked the question or made the statement, is this like, one of you made the statement, so help me, one of you made the statement and said, is this like Elijah's bones? Yes. You see, this is the power of the kingdom. Now, why the bones? It's not in the flesh, it's in the bones. Why is it in the bones? This also connects to Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. Why? The bones are so important, not because it's bones, but because it's in your bones that your marrow rest. Your marrow helps to create blood. <laughs> So out of the deep place of the blood, out of the bone, the marrow that sits in the middle of your bone, the blood, the DNA, when, you've, when, a, when the flesh is gone and there is nothing left, they will take your bone and crack it open and mix in fluid, and then they're able to find some of your DNA in the marrow in the bone. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Carrie. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he will. He will quicken your mortal body. Now, it's amazing to me. Yes. Come on, Nathan Zink, that's it. It's the place that regenerates DNA. That's where we were going. I love this whole class tonight. Y'all are walking with me through the word. Yes, Angela Rodgers, you found the scripture. And the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Woo! Now, think about this. The place where the blood is sitting inside of the bone you've got the bone sitting inside the bone the blood is resting it's flowing through your body but this marrow there's oxygen and there's blood mixing around and in this place what begins to happen it's where the dna is regenerated so right now what's happening the code the code that makes you you is in the marrow it's in the bones do you hear me? The code that makes you you. Now, 
Elijah, who is a revelation and a representation of the prophetic. That was Elisha and Elijah. Okay. Elijah came to the people, brought the glory of God, and released the glory to Elisha. Now walk with me. He released a double portion. We gonna teach tonight. Elijah raised how many people from the dead? Who knows? Come on, come on class, let's work together. Elijah raised two. No, excuse me, one. I believe it was one from the dead. Elijah raises one. Okay? Elijah raises one from the dead. One that we know of. One. Okay? Wait. Yes. The boy. You got it. The widow son. Come on, class. Y'all, y'all doing this thing tonight. That's right, Nathan. The boy. That's right, Shanae. The widow's son. So, Elijah raised one from the dead. Come on, Carl. Uh, Charlene Garrison, you done got the address. King 17. I loving y'all tonight. So now, yes, Zarephus. Okay, come on, Angela Rogers. Now, so Elijah raised one from the dead. Now, what did that son represent? I'm teaching more than I meant to tonight. I hope this is all right, class, but I feel like breaking this thing down. When you see that story, it says they had made a place for the prophet, okay? When he hears that the widow's son has died, widow of Zarephath, he raises the boy back from the dead. Now, when he raised the boy back from the dead, what did he do? He stretched out, I believe it was. Let's go here. Come on. Let's go here. We're going to work this word tonight. If you got your Bible, turn with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings 17. Let's work the word. Oh, 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 oh. I eat up. You better say that thing. Yes. Come on, Rachel Newman. That's right. He laid on top of him. So here we are. The meaning of Zarephath, and you're right, the meaning of Zarephath is the place where metal is tested. Metal. It's the place where you are tested. So the widow of Zarephath, Elijah the Tishbite, he's in this land, and he says, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. He arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel. She was going there. As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not but a little bit. And she said, I'm going to make this cake, and I'm going to die. Now, keep going. Down to verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. So let's remember this. This thing that's amazing. This thing that is incredible to me. This thing that goes beyond all thought. Elijah stretched himself upon the child three times. Cried out to the Lord. And when he cried out to the Lord, says, he stretched upon the child three times, cried unto the Lord and said, oh Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. Elijah took down the child, brought him down. Now, let's look at this. This is powerful meaning. Elijah, yes. So Elijah's DNA, his kingdom. He's got power in his bone. He's got glory in his voice. Elijah says, give me your son. 
he took him out of her bosom, carried him into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. Now, why his own bed? If you're going to move in the kingdom, there must be a place of intimacy where you build foundation with God. Going to move in the kingdom, you cannot pour out of an empty pot. Elijah was moving from a place of knowledge, intimacy. This bed, I rest here. I rest in my identity. I know who I am and this is where I can go to sleep. I'm safe here. So it speaks of a place of intimacy. It speaks of a place of identity. And in the place of identity and intimacy, he cries out unto the Lord and said, Oh Lord, my God, Hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son. Now, what is he saying? Check this out. What, I, what Elijah is saying to God, God, this woman has been good to me. This woman has connected to the oil on my life. This woman has a right to the prophetic blessing. God, if I am a kingdom man, and I carry the kingdom. Any blessing that she received through me must be eternal. I come from a different kingdom. I operate from a different level. I speak from a different authority. God, if I released a word over her family, this boy can't die like this. This makes the kingdom look bad. This makes the kingdom look sad. This makes us look unstable. I brought heaven to her house. Are you going to do evil now? Are you going to make the kingdom look weak? Are you going to pull back your power? God, if you're not going to do it for her, do this for me. Release your glory. And he stretches out three times. Why? Because three is the number of revelation. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, faith, hope, love. He who was, he who is, he who is to come. Three is the number of revelation. So Elijah says, this woman needs a revelation of your kingdom. This woman needs a revelation of your power. This woman needs to see you like I see you. So I'm going to stretch my Self. I'm not going to give almost. It won't be halfway. If I'm a, <clears throat> as a kingdom man, I'm going to stretch every gift, every worship, every praise, every thought, every prayer. I'm going to stretch what I carry till it covers the next generation. I'm not getting this for me, but the glory in me got to cover these teenagers. The glory in my life got to cover the children who are being abused. The glory in my life got to cover the school down the street. So God, I'm going to stretch what I got till the next generation can sit underneath this oil. I'm going to stretch my worship till it covers the next three city blocks. I'm going to stretch my preaching till sinners run in to be saved. I'm going to stretch my gift till I can employ a hundred people and break poverty off their life. I'm not going to settle for me and my house. I got to stretch until the glory that's in my life covers somebody else. That's the kingdom you carry. And the reason we don't see the full weight of the kingdom of God is because we don't stretch. We hear bad news. We hear, we see contrary reports. We hear negative words and we settle and go into depression and sadness. But you don't go into sadness. You don't back up and retreat. You don't let your mind get tormented. The moment you hear that something is contrary to the kingdom you carry, Stretch yourself and stand and say, uh-uh, not in this city, not on my street, not in my family. You got to get past me to get them. I'm going to stretch my faith and stand here. Why? Because I'm from a different kingdom. Devil, it might work out there, but it can't work in here. Because I'm not from this kingdom. Stretch yourself.
Now, we talked about Elijah. So the miracle of the dead child is a revelation of the kingdom coming to earth. Now, Elijah releases his mantle to Elisha, right? Okay. So Elisha raises two people from the dead. Two people, okay? That's the double portion. Elijah raised one. Yes. Elisha raised two. So Elisha raises two people from the dead. Now, when he raises two people from the dead, oh, come on here. So when Elisha raises two people from the dead, something amazing. So the first one we see, I love this. Y'all are working this word. Is when it says there is, let's see here. That's it. So now we go to 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4. That's right. Y'all are in this word. Come on here. 2 Kings 4. And we're going to look at this, and this is so rich. In 2 Kings 4, the Bible says, that's right. One of them was dead, dead. Dead, 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 dead. Doubly dead, dead. Shown up dead. Graveyard dead. Doorknob dead. So we see here that Elisha, think about it's a very similar case. We have a widow, and it says, in the place where he stayed. So there was a loft. It was a room. But now this family has built him a space. They built an apartment. And in the apartment, they put a lamp, a table, a bed. And a chair, a lamp, a table, a bed, and a chair. So the lamp, the table, the bed, the chair. Okay. Remember, Elijah had the bed he laid on. But when this prophet shows up, it says the child was dead. And he had told her, You're going to have a baby. And it says, In the heat of the day, this child that had been given as a miracle, he walked outside and he walked out to be with his father. Remember, the other woman didn't have a husband. Her son was alive, but her husband was nowhere to be seen. This woman has a husband, the Shunammite. She has a husband. Her child goes outside and he runs to his daddy and he has heat stroke. He has heat stroke and dies. This is so important. When he has heat stroke and he dies, the woman does not think God ain't going to move. Remember, the first woman goes, oh, no, it's over. And the prophet says, God, don't make the kingdom look crazy. But at noontime, yes, the boy drops dead. The woman says, the woman says, now you got to think about this. How did the woman know to put the dead boy in the prophet's room? Because this prophet knew the stories of his mentor. This prophet had heard the stories that my mentor put a dead boy on his bed, stretched out on him and prayed. Your kingdom history will become your kingdom future. That's why when God connects you to the right people, you've got to learn the patterns and the principles. You've got to learn the testimonies so that that becomes the full foundation of what you believe. Stop going back to <clears throat> what my mama said. Stop repeating what your daddy went through. Stop talking about what you lost. That's not your history any longer. Your new history is the kingdom. So whoever God connects you to in the kingdom, that becomes your stories. You need to hear me. I'm not saying just us, but if you've been listening to this teaching regularly, you ought to know these stories. When I tell a story that's happened to me, I'm telling it so that you can begin to say, God, if you did it for Michael, you got to do it for me and greater.
make it your story. Learn the history and then take it to God and say, God, I'm believing. If you did it for him, do it for me. Do it for me. Do it for me. You've got to pull on that thing. You've got to pull on it. You've got to grab a hold of it and begin to say, God, do it for me. Hey, do it for me. Now, when the woman who had heard the story delays her boy. Now, remember, Elijah was there when the first boy died. This prophet is in another town. So she lays her dead son on the prophet's bed. So what does that mean? You got to have enough faith in the prophetic foundation built in your life to let some stuff lay dead and not lose your mind. This marriage looks dead. My money looks dead. This job is over. I'm about to lose my house. The doctors say I'm going to die. It don't matter what the death report looks like. I know enough about God to lay this report on top of my faith. I'm going to let this bad news sit on top of the prophetic word I carry. And I'm going to sit here until I get a word from God. So she says, take me to the prophet. And when she gets near the prophet, hear this story. This is so rich. And this is about the kingdom. I, I'm going to wrap this all together. When she gets toward the prophet, Gehazi, Gehazi is looking out the window. And this is what it says. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. Verse 25, 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 25. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her far off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, over there is that Shunammite woman. Don't that look like the Shunammite? Run now, I pray you. Meet her and say to her, is it well with you? In other words, how you doing, sister? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered the servant, all is well, brother. I got no problems. I just came to talk to the prophet. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by, by the feet. Now, think about this. All the way, she tells the servant, go fast, ride fast. Don't slow down for me. I got to get where God is. I got to get where the anointing is moving. I got to get where worship is popping and praise is breaking. I got to get in that prayer meeting where the Holy Ghost shows up. Get me to the church on time. Don't slow down for nobody. I, I, today, I don't need no chit chat. I don't need no gossip. I don't need to check nobody's words. I don't need nobody to pray for me. Don't hug me outside the church. Don't give me no five words. I don't want nobody from the prayer team to hug me and greet me. Today, I'm on assignment. I got to get a miracle. I am in agreement with God. So I don't have time for y'all's foolishness this week. All that stupid stuff we did last week, I'm over it. I got to get a miracle from God. You better get up out my way. Move. I got to get to the presence. And she's getting to the presence. Now, when she gets to the presence, this is how you get a miracle. This is how the kingdom manifests in momentum, miracles, and multiplication. She gets there. Now, the first thing that will, I'm, I feel I'm teaching tonight. The first thing that can disconnect you from supernatural revelation and miracle power is the people you encounter when you get to the place of the encounter. I'm going to say that again. What can stop you from receiving is the people you encounter in the place of encounter. See, many times God sent you to that company or that house, that prophet or that teacher, that pastor, that worship gathering, that church. And you know, in your spirit, God told me he was going to meet me here today. You fought sickness 
illness, problems, and you got there because the kingdom is a magnet. God always speaks to what he's already put in you. Faith talks to faith. Power talks to power. Glory talks to glory. So you didn't just come to church or you didn't just come to that prayer meeting or you didn't just show up to that business session where they were talking kingdom. You didn't just show up because, oh, I was desperately in need. No, something from the kingdom was pulling you. So God was pulling you to himself. That's the power of the kingdom. But you must guard yourself because as soon as you enter into a kingdom encounter, the first test that you will face are people with no discernment. The first thing you will encounter are people with no discernment. You are in need of a miracle. You are in need of God to touch your children. You're in need of something supernatural to happen. But the people in the room are more interested in laying hands on you, getting in your face, hugging you, talking to you, asking you what you watched on TV. Somebody comes over and shows you something stupid on their phone or whispering some dumb joke in your ear. And all of that foolishness distracts you. And the singular focus of faith you had in your car, the focus of faith you had last night when you were praying, the hunger you had to encounter God begins to diminish because you started laughing with stupid people or you started getting distracted. So I want to say this to some of you, some of you in your churches or in your gatherings, because I see this all the time. Some of you need to learn how to tell people to their face. Don't put your hands on me today. Sit your behind down. I came to get a touch from God and I need to hear from God. And because I need to hear from God, I'm desperate for him. And you're distracting me. I came through the door with my mind on Jesus. And now you got your hands on my shoulder and your hands on my head. And I love ministry. But most of the people ministering today are doing it because they think they're Jesus. They have forgotten that the Holy Ghost been healing people for years without them. Most folks have forgotten that the worship service ain't about the people in the church. It's about God. So in the middle of worship, why are we shaking folks and pulling them out of worship? Why are we up in people's faces going, this week I thought about you and I got a word for you. I'm worshiping the king. I'm finally in a place where I can hear the voice of God. I'm finally in a place where I can worship the almighty. And you can't give me five minutes alone with God because you got you got my cell phone number. You know my address. You telling me you couldn't talk to me yesterday. You can't talk when church is over. The only time you can tell me something not worth hearing is when my hands are lifted. So I say to people all the time, don't interrupt my worship. Mm -mm. I can hug you. When the worship is over, I can greet you before you leave church. You can tap me on the shoulder if you got to go and say, we'll talk this week. You got my number. You know how to call me. Why are you? Come on here. I feel it in my soul. You better leave me alone. Why? Because we're snatching folks out of their encounter with God to talk about nothing. Nothing. I listen to people give all these prophetic words and half these prophetic words ain't got nothing to do with God. It's just something you really wanted to bless them with. Well, then text it to them. That word you gave wasn't that deep. It wasn't that special. It didn't change nothing. If they had been allowed to finish worshiping through that song, they were already crying. They already felt his presence. They were already talking to the almighty. God is already healing their heart. So you snatch them off the operating table so you could ask them how you feeling. You interrupted the operation. The doctor had a scalpel in my heart and you snatched me off the table to ask me how my week was. If we wasn't in church, I'd punch you in your mouth. Woo because the one thing I've needed was to feel his glory cut through my confusion and heal my soul 
and I'm finally feeling God face to face and you snatch me out of my encounter so that you can say something silly just so you can tell somebody at the end of church, you gave me a word. That's not prophecy, that's performance. Perform for somebody else. I need God. I need his presence. I need his glory. I need to sit with him. I need to hear him. Oh, oh, that's right, DJ. That's the whole thing. See, we've come to a place where we've stolen the beauty of worship from people. And we've made everything about, can we catch you in a moment with God? So you finally encountered the Lord and we robbed you of the ecstasy of a face-to-face -face meeting with the Almighty because we needed a photo of you to put up on our site. Oh, saints, saints. So, oh, I got to get back to it. I could teach on this right here all night. This right here, I'm going to teach on this in different prophetic gatherings and teach on this idea of we're robbing people of their encounter. The prophet, when the first thing you encounter is somebody, or oh, we're going to get to them seven sneezes, you know we are. The first thing that happened in this divine encounter is somebody with no discernment. So Gehazi comes. And hear this, the people that interrupt your breakthrough the most often are the people who have been lent authority. Now, I want you to get that. The people who interrupt your encounter with God the most are the people who have borrowed authority. Not permanent authority, borrowed authority. Somebody in the church, an assistant pastor, a pastor, a usher, um, a greeter, lent authority. Lent authority means you have lent it to them. You loaned it to them. It's not permanent. God didn't give it to them. It means you got authority from someone else, but not from God. No, borrowed authority is legal. It is legal, but it's not backed by heaven. So in the church, if the pastor gives the ushers permission to direct you to your seats, then the authority the usher has was loaned from the pastor. So who are you to tell me where to sit? The pastor says, I have authority to act in this position. So it's loaned authority. Now it's not heaven's authority and it's not given. That's why I say loaned authority versus given authority. Given authority, God gives authority. So God gave you authority to operate in your calling. But in that church, they loaned you authority. Why is it loaned? Authority given by God can never be taken back by men. But loaned authority can be recalled at the moment they are tired of you. So at the moment they don't want you to be a secretary, they take it back. Yes, it's a hall monitor. It's a, it's a greeter. It's, it's um, an usher. The prayer team. The prophetic team in the house. It's conditional. Come on, Shanae. So it's authority that is only temporary. Not backed by heaven, but backed by man. Now, given authority, God breathed on you. And God says, heaven will back you up in that position. So if the preacher don't like you, if the pastor can't stand you, if the church don't want to give it to you, if you don't have no license, no ordination, and nowhere that anybody wants you to preach, if God really gave you authority, authority from heaven will prove itself. So just keep standing, preach, talk, show up, and God will back you up. So people with loaned authority are normally the ones that mess up the church the most often. God didn't call them to do anything. He didn't anoint them to do it, but they decided that they should do it or they 
offered their skill to do it or they volunteer to do it. So we give them permission. And because we didn't check with God, but we, we worked with their gift or their permission, then when they bring all their wounds and unhealed garbage and nastiness and their issues and they vomit on the people of God or they miss the voice of God and just come up with a good idea, but not a God idea, we spend years fixing what loaned authority breaks. Because if it had been given authority, the Holy Ghost would have said, don't do that. If it was heaven's authority, God would have said to the pastor or the prophet, to the evangelist, to the teacher, to the apostle, wait a minute, talk to them, something's going off. Because if it's, if it's given authority, the leader feels them in his spirit. The leader feels them in her spirit because God has connected you together for the sake of the house. So God begins to make that clear. Who do you connect with and how do you flow with it? So this is key to knowing. You say, how can we, a little bit about how you discern when and how to move in God's authority. Well, first of all, God's authority never brings disorder. So walking in God's authority, you don't, I say it this way. If God has called you to minister or to flow, no, no, it's okay. Oh, I eat it. This is good. This is where we ask questions. This is so good. If God gives you position, authority, or calling, you never have to. This is, I'm about to answer it, Rachel. You don't have to fight the pastor or the preacher. See, God may have told you to be there, but he didn't say that's where your destiny is. What do I mean by that? I'm going to say this very simply. A pastor is called to pastor your walk with God, not your call from God. So they are called to help shift you and train you. But if a leader makes a decision to not agree, now I'm not talking about rebellion. If you are in a denomination or a group that don't want women to preach, don't believe in the Holy Ghost. Don't believe in the prophecy or the prophetic or signs and wonders. You don't have to necessarily run away from that church. What you have to settle in your mind. God said, you're supposed to help me walk out a good life in God. Okay, so that's helping me understand how to love people. Helping me understand how to be good to people. He's given me a community of saints to walk with. Your messages are to help the sheep grow. So I receive your word into my life for my personal walk. My personal walk. But my walk with God, that walk with God is not controlled or held hostage by the pastor. Your ministry in God that's why you've got to find good people. Now, if you're in a healthy church, your pastor is the best one to help you walk it out because they will pray for you. Now, I always mention Pastor Jim Bain. Jim Bain, one of the best pastors I've ever known, and I always celebrate him because I'll send him my schedule. I'll talk about where I'm going. He'll pray about every trip. He'll call me sometimes and say, are you sure about that? Think about this. He'll call me and say, that trip don't sound right. Uh, pray. And so he never tries to control the flow of the ministry. But what he does is he says, I just don't know if that trip is going to be good for you. I don't know if they're going to agree with God. It might be more weight on you or more weary for you or worry for you. So he helps me. He shepherds me while I carry the ministry. But and he will tell you. But in the early days, we had a conversation where the Lord had told me to go somewhere. And uh, he said, uh, the Lord told me not to go on one trip to the Philippines. And the Lord said, you can't go on that trip. And so he was talking to me and he said, are you sure about that? And he said, you know, I just don't know how to wrestle with the fact that you told him you were coming and you're not going to go. He said, I, I, it just don't feel right. And what I loved in that moment was. He was trying to help me with the ministry. And I said to him, I said, I want you to always tell me what you hear from God. I said, but I want you to know I love you and I know you hear God. I said, but 
it's my job to direct this ministry. And I need you to pray with me so that I can, I said, because when I stand before God, I have to answer for the ministry. You answer for my soul. So all you got to do is, I said, help me stay holy, help me stay clean, and help me stay humble. I said, then you have been a good shepherd, and, and he's a phenomenal shepherd, and that's what he's done. I said, but I have to answer for how, what I teach in the ministry, where I go in the ministry, how the ministry grows, where we invest the money. Everything about the ministry, God will hold me, God will never ask your pastor what you did in your ministry he will ask you god is not going to hold your pastor hostage or send him to hell for mistakes you made in your company you have to answer for that so you are called for your business and for your ministry you pastor it you shepherd it you lead it no pastor gets to tell you what to do in your ministry or in your business that is witchcraft that's control that is a controlling spirit. That's a plantation mentality. That is bondage. I want to make that clear. That is not the Bible. And anybody that tells you that that is the Bible, they are a liar and the truth ain't in them. That's either bad doctrine, bad teaching, or they just flat out lying to control you. I'm not playing with this. I don't care if they get mad. If they can show me in the Bible where God gives them permission to control your future decisions then I will turn it over on the side and show you that is not the real Bible because it ain't in the book. Control is not the kingdom. Manipulation is not the kingdom. That's witchcraft. And anyone who believes they have the right to control all your future decisions just because you're in their church, then they are not being good pastors. Now, it doesn't mean they're not a good pastor. It means, but they're not pastoring you correctly because they need to go back and get the biblical model. If they were taught wrong, they're going to do it wrong. But they have to go back to the word. This is why the word is so good. So I make it clear. And you have the freedom. Let me say this. You have the freedom. If it's the word that they're giving you and saying, if it's for your soul, to keep you humble, to keep you loving, and to keep your character right, their job is to bring those things to you regularly. But their job is not to direct your calling or control your decisions. That's witchcraft. And I know many of you have experienced that. And I've had pastors say to me, you know, it makes me nervous when you teach that, then be nervous. Because I know hundreds of good pastors around the world that when I teach you like this, they're the first one standing going, amen. Why? Because a good pastor wants you to learn how to self-govern. The goal of good pastoring is a people who can self-govern. Because self-governing means maturity. You are a lousy mama and daddy. If your child is sane, they got a right mind and they're 25 and they come home every night for you to cut up their meat and help them put on their pajamas, tuck them into bed and you singing a song over them and they are grown, sane, healthy adults. That is the height of codependency. And if you like your children needing you, you are the weakest form of a parent. Because your children, when they are grown, should want you in their life, but they should not need you in their life. I I'm trying to make it plain tonight. A good parent, once your child is released from your home and they begin to grow, they will look back with joy and say, Oh, I want a good relationship with my mom and daddy. I want my mother. Rita Dalton is my favorite woman on the planet. I adore her. 
I want her in my life forever. Why? Because my mother is a joy to me. I love talking to her. She gives me good wisdom. She's praying for me. She'll say some things that make me think. Larry Dalton is my favorite man on the earth. He is a wonderful man of God, but he's also a great brother in the Lord now. So what has happened is as I became an adult, I now want them in my world. I rejoice to hang out with my parents, talk to them on the phone. Why? Because they raised me to self-govern. So when I became an adult, all that envy or spite or hatred or desire to get away from my parents and never talk again, none of that was there because I didn't have to escape them because they released me. Good teaching raises people to a place of self-governance, builds a strength of character, confirms in you the freedom of thought and releases you to build destiny outside of the home where you were raised so that the kingdom can be extended and the borders be increased. The kingdom cannot increase if everybody is still in the same church waiting for the same pastor to tell them what to do. That is the height of weakness. That's the height of weakness. That is the height of insecurity. That is the proof that you don't have a shepherd, you have a hireling. It is the proof that you never outgrew the field you were eating in. And it is the sign that you would rather be a slave than a son. Because sons leave their father's house so they can multiply their daddy's name. Slaves never leave because they don't believe they can survive on their own. The kingdom. My goodness. I I'm going to have to wrap, wrap this up. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So as we go in the kingdom. Woo. I can keep, listen, you know I can keep teaching. But, okay, you know what? Let's keep going. If you have to leave, you just go. But we're going to pour this thing out. I'm going to finish teaching about this because it all ties together. When you get to this man. Elijah has one healed. Elisha has two. Now, Elisha does this whole thing and Gehazi cannot understand. He doesn't discern. So it says, check this out. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi said, Gehazi comes near to thrust her away. So remember, the biggest battle you'll have are the people who have no discernment while you're about to experience a breakthrough. I put it this way. It's when church folk get in the way of the kingdom. Church folk getting in the way of the kingdom. She's holding on to the foot of the prophet. She's holding on to the foot of her breakthrough. She's holding on to the edge of her blessing. And Gehazi is about to roll her out the way. And the man of God said, leave her alone. Her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me. Now, I want you to hear this statement. We always teach on this miracle. And I'm about to break it all down. But here is the moment. I want you to get this. This is the moment when Elisha should have fired Gehazi. This is the moment when Elisha should have fired Gehazi. Gehazi continues with the prophet for years. And he ends up lying, taking, coveting and he gets cursed by God the leprosy that was on the leper Naaman 
jumps on to Gehazi. It gets on Gehazi. God cursed him. Why? This is not the time for raiment or for gold. So you left my presence. My spirit, the prophet said, my spirit went with you. I saw the lust, the greed, and the lying that was in you. And now the same leprosy that was on him comes on you. Now think about this. If he had fired Gehazi right here or rebuked him, it never says he rebuked Gehazi. This is the moment when the prophet should have looked at Gehazi and said, wait a minute. I can understand that you don't see what's going on because God hasn't shown it to me either. But you should have enough sense, Gehazi. If I didn't tell the woman to let go, why are you reaching for her? If you're not even following my example, then you're not here to learn from me. You're here to see what you can get. So why are you here, Gehazi? You're not here to learn. You're not here to grow. You're not here taking notes. Every time I turn around, Gehazi, you're throwing the hungry people out the room and you're pulling the weary people in the Gehazi, you're getting in the way of the anointing. Why are you here? Because if he had dealt with Gehazi then, come on, Laura Shula, read the room, buddy. I look at some folks in the prophetic and I look around and go, okay, you are revealing to me that you really ain't here for what God is doing. <laughs> some folks don't know I know. You love and you bless all over the world. I go and I look at, I go into meetings, I go into churches, I look at the church staff, I look at the worship team, I watch people moving around and I go, oh. But the Holy Ghost wasn't doing that right then. So why are you doing that over there? Oh, you ain't here for what God is doing. You're here to do your thing. Okay, Gehazi. I get it. Everybody's laid out on the floor worshiping. But you over here prophesying. Oh, Gehazi. I get it. Okay, everybody else is weeping. But instead of weeping, you standing up talking. Oh, okay, Gehazi. Thank you for showing me who you are. Everybody else is crying out to God and worshiping. And you got this one in the room who never worships. They just want to walk around and lay hands or prophesy or hug or scream or shout or push, whatever it is. Everywhere I go in the world, in the moves of God, I watch, I was in a service uh, down in South America, a great move of God. People got caught up in worship. It was about 600 people. They all had their hands up weeping. And there was a, they told me he was a young prophet. The young prophet was walking around the room and while people had their hands up, he was just touching them on the head and they was falling. And he was going, ooh, Look at what God is doing. And as they were celebrating him touching folk, he walked up and he was standing beside me and I turned to him. I said, sit your arrogant behind down. He said, sir. He said, prophet of God. I said, sit down. Don't you move again. Don't you move. He said, but the Lord, I said, God didn't tell you to do that. I said, you saw the presence on them and your gift activated. But just because your gift activated didn't mean God gave you permission. Every car in the parking lot, you can turn the engine on. But that don't mean you're supposed to be rolling through the parking lot driving. Power is not permission. Power is not permission. Just because you felt his power does not mean he gave permission. You've got to, 
Yes, Danny Shepherd. Not only discern the atmosphere, you've got to wait for authority. Because all authority is either given or loaned. And if you're in the place where the prophet or the apostle or the teacher or the preacher or the evangelist is moving, you flow when they flow, but make sure you have permission to flow because God might be ready to shift. And if we're moving in the wrong direction, you can stop the glory from moving in the rest of the room because you moved in a moment you shouldn't move just because you didn't check with authority. So the young man, he was a prophet. He is a prophet. He's still moving prophetically. But I said, don't you move because I realized nobody had ever told him. He said, but I thought, I said, I know you thought, but God's not interested in your thoughts. He said, oh, I said, be still. Nathan, this is so good. I'm seeing this when people are not used to God really showing up in meetings. Absolutely. It's so true. See, what happens is if you are in a place where often the oil is dry, then as soon as we get into an atmosphere where the oil is thick, everybody that hears God activates. Wonder Twins activate and everybody do, 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 and we all just go. Now, I'm teaching this because I used to do it. Uh, in the churches, when I first got to California, we would visit churches and I thought, my God, this place couldn't be no drier if you put it in an oven, rolled it in the desert, sat it on top of a microwave and just blew on it for three hours. Couldn't be no dry. Couldn't be no dry. Couldn't be no dry. No, no, Valley of Dry Bones is a bowl of soup compared to some of the churches I visited. And I remember going into a meeting. And the place was so dry, and we went right down the street, another church. Um, it was actually a, um, an Indonesian church, and they invited us to come, and they were worshiping. And the power of God began to move. And the prophetic hit, and we had a prophetic team, and we began to prophesy five and a half hours. 400 people there. We prophesied five and a half hours. We prophesied to everybody. We, I swear, I think I prophesied to a picture on the wall and the picture started crying. The picture said, you don't know what you just said to me. I mean, God's power was in that place. At the end of the night, we were leaving. And the Lord said to me, that's right, Mona Lisa was crying. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. Mona, I gave a word. I, I heard the Lord touch. We prayed for the picture. Mona Lisa started crying and I heard an angel singing, Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, men have named you. You know, I mean, I just, I didn't know. I just, I didn't know what that was right there. I just felt. And so, <laughs> how did Mona Lisa, I'm sorry, y'all. I got to act right. Okay. Now, <laughs> we need a show. Yes, we do Angela Rogers. We need a show where we just do kingdom comedy where we take some of the crazy stuff we've seen and just loose it to the world, okay? And the Lord said to me at the end of that, four and a half hours, five hours of nonstop pro prophecy, four and a half hours, I remember strong. I don't know if it was a little less or a little, but I know it's four and a half. The Lord said to me, that was a good night. I said, yes, Lord, it was. The Lord said, you enjoyed yourself. I said, oh yes, it was powerful. The Lord said, you prophesied to everybody. I said, we got everybody. And then he said to me, that last hour was just you working your gift. It was not me leading you. I said, what? He said, the gift belongs to you, but you belong to me. I want you to hear that. Uh, people, people say, and some people hear this and say, oh no, oh yes, it does. The Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Once you begin to flow in healing ministry long enough, you begin to pray and anywhere you pray, somebody's going to get healed. It's a gift. He gave it to you. So you could give it to the world. God doesn't take back his gift. That's why the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So God gives you the gift. As the gift is given, he says, now give it to the world. So what happens is once you learn how to open the faucet, 
you can just keep the faucet open. So I've reached a place in God now where whether I'm in a restaurant, on a bus, on a plane, if I just quiet my mind and begin to pray on the inside, Father, I know you love them. The moment I say I know you love them, I'll begin to see something about their life. I have to turn it off. Excuse me. So from morning to night, I can prophesy to anyone around me. So the question is not, can you prophesy? The question is, should you prophesy? Did you ask God? They may not be ready mentally to hear a word from God. So you just need to encourage them. Some people don't need a prophecy. They need a hug. You're seeing stuff about them, but all you need to do is just walk over and say, I just want to hug you. God loves you today. The question is not, can you? The question is, should you? That's why the hardest thing for most prophetic people to learn is when not to prophesy. Did God say to speak? So I go to prophetic gatherings, and if, if you've ever seen me in a lot of places, people will turn to me and say, prophesy. And I love when especially pastors will turn to me now and say, I know you got another word. Go ahead and prophesy. And, and I'm not trying to be funny. I've been prophesying for 30 years. I've been obeying God for a long time. I've been prophesying before you ever learned about the prophetic. And now you think you need to tell me to prophesy. It is some of the stupidest arrogance I've ever seen. Because people think because at that moment, if I just tell you to prophesy, you'll prophesy. It's not magic. We're not magicians. And it's not witchcraft. Trust that the prophet can hear God. Now bring people up who you want prayer for. And I'll ask God if there's a word because I'm going to honor your authority in your house. But recognize I'm asking God to bless them. I'll give them a quick prayer of blessing. But as far as prophesying, I could prophesy, but the Holy Ghost didn't say to do it. So if you want a word for them, go get a fortune. Oh, Nathan's ink you all up in my word. I was going to say, go get a fortune cookie. Go down to the psychic at the end of the street. Call one of them little numbers and see what they tell you. Because what you're trying to do is play around in the spirit world to make your people feel better. And what most people need is not a new word. They need discipleship. Most people in church don't need a new prophecy. They need someone mature enough to help them learn how to guard, grow, and then gather the prophetic words they already have. So most pastors or most leaders, most churches want a prophet to do in a weekend what they haven't took it, taken the time to do in a year. You want the prophet to come in and just tell somebody, live right. No, if you were teaching them how to carry their soul, you could have brought them to maturity in the last 12 months, but you didn't want to deal with their issue. So you save their sin for the prophet. You save their pain for prophecy. You save their trauma for prophetic encounter. So you want the prophet, the apostle, and the evangelist to fix what you won't confront. That's foolishness. If you disciple the people, the people will grow. If you don't disciple the people, the prophetic cannot heal what church won't deal with. If you won't deal with the issue, you can't prophesy it out. The prophetic cannot heal what the church won't deal with. You've got to disciple. You've got to commit to growing. So this Gehazi, because he was not confronted, he stuck around. And he brought trouble and confusion. Now we got to get to this. So what happened? Okay, let's break this down and wrap this up. My goodness. I, I, know, I hope this is blessing y'all. Listen, I can see y'all have stuck with me on this one. This is what I love. So let's, let's jump to it. 
he tells Gehazi. Now, this is why I say he should have fired Gehazi. She says, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he says to Gehazi, gird up thy loins. Take my staff in your hand. Go thy way. If you meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not. Lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, as thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Now, listen to me. Gehazi passed on before them. He laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore, he went again to meet him and told him and said, the child is not awake. Now, now uh, we, we got to hit this thing. Woo! Oh, Julia Winston, we're going we gonna to get there, I promise. Now, this is why I say Gehazi should have been fired. The woman had discerned God wasn't with Gehazi. But the prophet hadn't discerned God wasn't with Gehazi. I need you to understand what this. The prophet gives his staff to Gehazi and said, go. Don't talk to nobody. Don't answer nobody. Don't let nobody interrupt you. Run on. Lay the staff on the child. Lay my staff upon the face of the child. And when you lay upon the face of the child, he said, what did you say? He said, when you lay the staff on the face of the child, in other words, the child should live. The woman looks at Gehazi and says, go on. Bye, Gehazi. She turns and looks at the prophet and said, I'm sticking right here with you. Why? I ain't never seen God do nothing for him. That's right, Wendy Mark. Bye, Felicia. I ain't never seen God do nothing for him. And he already proved to me when he tried to roll me off your feet, he can't discern. If you can't discern my need, then you cannot bring my breakthrough. If you cannot discern my need, you cannot bring my breakthrough. So Gehazi, bye. Now Gehazi goes off and look at what he does. He does what the prophet said, but it says as soon as he did it and he saw no result, he ran back to the prophet. I have a question. Here's the next question. Now, we're going to break this thing down. Some of you need to recognize that oftentimes, long before leaders in churches, leaders in businesses, even leaders or people in friendships, long before some people recognize that God is not with their choice, you may recognize God is not with their choice. And you've got to trust what the Holy Ghost reveals. Oftentimes, people choose people for position based on skill set, ability, or need. But God chooses by heart, destiny, and calling. So when the Holy Ghost says to you, don't, don't, don't let them lay hands on you. When the Holy Ghost says, that word they gave you ain't from me. When the Holy Spirit says, don't you trust them. And then suddenly someone you trust tells you, oh, no, no, I know God is with them. Now, the Holy Spirit has already revealed he's not with them. So you have been stepping over the direction of the Holy Spirit. 
to honor somebody's choice when God has made it clear it is not his choice. There's no fruit in their life. There's no power in their hands. There's no kindness in their character. There's no breakthrough. So you've got to, and Julia Winston, you say, how do you trust what the Holy Ghost reveals when everybody is saying the opposite? Well, I learned years ago, if God is telling me to go left, if the whole world goes right, bye. Bye, y'all. Hello, I'll see y'all over there. Oh, no, no, uh, Julia, I know you know. I know you know. No. So I wasn't saying that to you. I'm. And listen, everybody, I know Julia. Julia knows this. But Julia, that's the thing. We have to know, and so many people who are watching, the key for so many people is we give up our, mm, yes, Holy Ghost. We throw away our own wisdom because we want people to like us. So instead of us standing our ground and suffering, the rejection and the isolation that may come for a season of standing for truth alone, we yield and we bow to the lie. But then all of a sudden, months or years later, the truth comes out. And so many people will say something like this. Oh, I knew that man was a thief. I always felt it. I knew that woman was up to no good. You felt it in here, but you went along with everything they did because other people said, I'm not, now let me make it clear. There's a difference between judging people and judging by the spirit. Judging people means I have decided you are not worthy of what God paid for you. True judgment, when the Bible says judge not, for all of you who get caught up in that, the Bible says judge not. The Bible is not saying not to judge. It's saying do not make eternal predictions or decisions about someone's soul. So that word judge is talking about weighing someone like a judge. It's talking about eternity. So don't look at somebody and say, they're not worth the gospel. They're not worth prayer. Don't judge them and say, ain't no good in them. Don't judge them and say, they're cursed. The kind of judgment it's talking about is to discern or decide that someone has no value. But to judge what God reveals, that's what the spirit of discernment is. So discernment is, I believe there's good in you. I believe God loves you. I know God loves you. God loves you just as much as he loves me. But I can't trust you because the Holy Spirit reveals that you're a thief. You're going to steal money. I love you. I'll feed you if you're hungry. I'll clothe you if you're naked. I'll pray for you if you get in trouble. But you're not going to get a key to my house. You're not going to get my money. I'm not going with you on a trip. You're not going to babysit my kids. I'm not going to let you in my house at night because the Holy Ghost is showing me there's something hiding behind them eyes. So I'm not judging your soul, but I do discern your intention. I see your motives. I see your intention. I see what's in your heart. So I discern what's in you. So for many of you, you've got to learn that God is trying to tell you. Don't give people access. Don't give them permission. Don't let them deep into your life. It requires you. Discernment protects your heart, your home, and your future. Judgment is to decide they're not worth anything. Discernment is to see God's intention for their life, but to understand the boundaries necessary for your protection. I know God's got good things for your life, but until we deal with this, I can't let you in here. Why? Because one day you're going to be awesome. But right now, you're a thief. One day you're going to be fantastic. But right now, you're a killer. One day you're going to be amazing. But right now, you lie like breathing. So I see your future. I prophesy your future. 
And this is where the prophetic community gets twisted up. See where people are, prophesy where they're going and build boundaries that help them get there. And yes, Julia Winston, you're right on. Do not let people manipulate you, not only into their mess by asking for prayer, but a couple of things. Don't let, I call it charismatic coercion. Charismatic coercion is when we use all of the Holy Ghost language and we quote scriptures and we say things in such a way. Charismatic, those that have the gifts, the charisma, coercion. The manipulation of trying to get people to do what you want. So charismatic coercion is when someone who uses charismatic ideas, terms, and knowledge to manipulate you into getting what they want. And they try to make you do it. Oh, that's good. We can follow each other on Facebook, but I cannot give you my password. So there has to be boundaries. So the coercion is I, I listen to people go. Listen, if you're really my, my, my brother and sister, you ought to come help me do this. No, not if the Lord didn't say so. Coercion. Oh, if you really love me, you'll let me speak in this church. If you really love me and you're a worship leader, you'll let me sing on your team. If you really love me and you're a business owner, you'll give me a job. I, I'd be good. But God is making it clear. Don't hire them. Don't give them no job. God in here tells you, don't trust them. But the coercion is they keep, every time they show up in church, while y'all are praying together and worshiping. So now here's where it gets deeper. Coercion. It is witchcraft. Coercion. Now they bring prophetic words to you. The Lord was showing me that you and I are going to work together. And I see us walking together. I see us doing business together. Now, first they brought you a business idea and you said no. Now they come to you and they have a prophetic word that will get you to do what you've already said no to. So they began to say, well, the Lord was showing me that we should work together. But you didn't have a prophecy until I told you no. So now you have prophecy. When you reject the prophecy, now they come back with a dream. I keep having this dream. And in this dream, uh, you and I are building a company together. And in this company, I see millions of dollars flowing through our hands. And, and I, okay. But I told you no. And my yay is yay and my no is no. Okay. That didn't work. Then you came to me with a prophecy. Okay. That didn't work. Now you got a dream. OK, now, when you reject their dream and think about all the ways this could work. Oh, oh no. Well, Nancy, Young, I don't care if it was a dream. I don't care if they woke up saying that they had three unicorns, four angels and 15 midgets dancing a jig to an Irish song and drinking out of a helmet. They dream don't matter if God didn't say yes. See, never let someone manipulate you by telling you. And that's for all of us. This is the charismatic coercion. They come to you with these things that matter to us. Dreams matter in prophetic circles. So they come to you with a dream. Now, take it to the next level. When you don't respond to the dream, what do they do? They go find someone else in church or in the kingdom or another Christian, and they tell them over and over, I believe the Lord wants us to work together. Or I believe that person should marry that person. Or I believe that they should go to this college. Now, they tell it to that person so many times that when you then come to prayer meeting, they then begin to pray and they say, oh, I hear the Lord saying once again that you should make this decision. Now, the person who they have infected with their gossip, their lie, their language, this person who doesn't discern they're being manipulated, turns and says to you, now, you know what? I really believe that's the Lord. Well, they don't believe it's God, but they have let someone else talk into their ear until that has now become their thought process. And now they're trading that 
and giving it to you. This is how witchcraft enters into the prophetic. And they can take it on further and further. When you don't respond, they'll add it. So what I call it is they add layer upon layer. If you don't respond to a lie, they'll come back with another person to back it up. If you don't respond to that, they'll come back and tell you the Lord gave them a scripture. So what's happening over and over is there is this constant desire people have to influence you. You cannot yield to it. You got to do what the Lord says do. Yes. And then you get, you're already there. And then they get to the place where if you don't do what they want you to do, they start to announce what I call Pentecostal curses or biblical witchcraft. They try to put a scripture on it and they go, now listen, got to understand the Lord's been talking to me about this so long. I feel like you're going to get sick if you don't obey that word. Or something in your world goes wrong and they say, oh, that's why you had that accident. You didn't do what the Lord says. Don't let anybody manipulate you. Don't let anyone control you. Don't let anyone push you into a place where they own your choices by manipulating you. Follow the voice of God. <laughs> Follow the voice of God. Okay. Saints, I'm going to have to stop here. We're going to finish up the, the rest of Elisha, and we're going to pull in the other part of Jesus. We're going to finish this whole lesson up because it goes from level to level. I hope this blessed you. I hope, class, you're enjoying it. Uh, this is where I love how we're going. We are breaking the word down and showing the truth of Jesus and the principles of the kingdom to go into the deep places of God. And so, oh, wonderful. Bless you, Camille. Bless you, Nancy Young. Muna, Nastasia, Nathan Zink, Danny Shepard, Charlene, Julia Winston, Shanae. Oh, come on. Connie Lockett, Rachel Newman, DJ. This is, we're going into Gifty Edwards, Shanae Rich, Camille Sinclair. We're digging into the word because in the word is where we find life. Oh, my goodness. Danny Shepard, you got me laughing. This was so good. Bless my socks off. I can't even find my socks. Leave them socks wherever they are. Just run around in your bare feet. Linda Daniels, the Lord bless you. Carrie, the Lord bless you. Collette Weston, God bless you. Ginger Knott, Angela Rogers, gracias. Blessings unto you. Wendy Mark, oh, the Lord is good. Oh, bless you. Yes. So to each of you, be blessed. Nancy Young, no socks tonight. So we bless God. Omar, blessings to you. Jonathan Garcia, blessings to you. So to each one of you, be blessed. Walk in the beauty of the kingdom of God. Let God keep giving you more and more. And hold on. Over the weekend, we're going to be back with you. If you're anywhere in Southern California, join us Sunday morning at Desert Christian Community Church, DC3. I'm preaching there. So Thousand Palms, California is where the church is. Sunday morning, 10 a.m., I'll be preaching here. And I'm going to minister a unique word that I've never preached before, really. And the word is very simple. The testimony of Jesus. And I'm going to preach on every prophecy Jesus fulfilled from his birth up to him dying on the cross. Jesus is the greatest, most verifiable person in history. Not just because of the Bible, but because when you look back historically, there's 15 different prophets who delivered over 40 different prophecies who were separated by over 3,000 years, who had hundreds of miles between them, no technology to share their words, no team to explain to each other what the other had said written down in four different languages. And all of these prophecies perfectly align in the person of Jesus Christ. For that to actually happen, mathematically, systematically, it would be easier for you to put all the planes of an airplane laying separate on the ground and a tornado come through and the tornado assembled the plane 
That would be easier for that to happen than all those prophecies coming to pass in one person's life in a 30 year span. So beloved, if you can be with us, you want to be with us because at the end of the service, the Lord told me to lay hands on those present and pray that God would give them the spirit of revelation so they could see in the word and hear in the word, the deep things of God. All right. We love you. We bless each one of you. Connect with us. I normally don't do this, but I give you space. If you want to sow into the ministry, you can sow. If you want to give, you can give. If not, you don't need to. But I'm just saying to you, if you want to sow, for your sake, you can sow. Because this weekend, when we get ready to teach on these things, we want to declare. I'm going to be declaring over each one of you. And then I'm going to release a date soon when I'm going to, those who want to, I want to take you through 10 days of a Daniel fast. And we're going to go through a Daniel fast. And on each of those days, we're going to teach on deciphering dreams and visions. Uh, I may do it like an online conference. I'm praying about it. But 10 days of going through, breaking down dreams and visions, how to interpret dreams and visions, and teaching on that. Oh, the conference at DC3 will be the first weekend of May. The first weekend of May. Uh, Angela Rogers, okay, we're going to do it. Okay, so I'm going to announce it. I think what I'll do, I'll connect with Angela and Patrick. I'm going to come up with with the thing. And I think what we'll do is announce it online for maybe a, a couple of weeks. We'll give people a chance to connect with us. And then I want to take you through a Daniel fast. The Daniel fast is the biblical way to receive the spirit of discernment for the interpretation of dreams and visions. And so I'm going to teach on dreams and visions, discernment for 10 days straight. And then we're going to pray on that 10th day and multitudes are going to receive an impartation of understanding dreams and visions. All right. I love y'all. Be blessed. Love Arise is coming up. If you're in town, you, you're welcome to be with us. We're going to be talking about legacy. And so uh, my mother and father are coming in town. Pastor Jim Bain is flying back in town. We have three days uh, Friday night. We'll be at uh, 7 p.m., I believe. A Saturday morning, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening. So five glorious services in the presence and power of God where we're going to talk about kingdom legacy, the legacy of love, how to bring the legacy of God to the next generation. And so that's why uh, my father will come out. And so we're going to minister together, generations ministering together, explaining the move of God generation to generation. For those of you that want to come out, come out. And we'll keep you abreast of the dreaming and discerning 10-day Daniel fast. For the rest of it, if you want to connect to us, connect. You already saw how to give if you want to give. Other than that, be blessed this night. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord smile upon you. May the Lord keep you and may he give you peace. I love you and I bless you in Jesus' name.